Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our online service. There are no people in front of me today except for volunteers, uh, and so it's a little bit different here in our environment, but no matter what church looks like for us, we always have the goal of, of helping, of hoping to help people find and live out their purpose, and we believe that, that purpose is connected to experiencing and expressing God's glory, but it's lived out in different people's lives in different ways. And, uh, and so on this last Sunday of, of uh, the year, I want to do something that Jared kind of beat me to the punch in last uh, week, but I want to say thank you to our volunteers, uh, especially the volunteers who have made church happen. They're right here in front of me, a big group of them. They don't know that I'm doing this, uh, but it has been a wild year, and you guys, plus some other people who aren't here right now, have sacrificed uh, so much in order to keep our church moving forward, uh, in order to help our church, you know, reach people and, and help people and grow people and stay connected and do all the things that we do. And so uh, from the bottom of my heart, I want to say thank you for your sacrifices. Uh, it has been really humbling for me to watch as I've tried to navigate things, but you guys have just done it so willingly, so graciously, and, and super well. We've grown a lot as a team in the last eight months. We were just joking about that before we went on. And so uh, thank you guys and, and you guys who are on, on the air. We've had people learning things that they never thought that they were going to learn this year. You know, from Brandon way back in, in March, uh, getting handed a computer and saying, hey, you gotta, you gotta put all these different instruments together. So figure that out, you know, to uh, Claudia back here running a live stream, to people who are running our Facebook feed every week that are typing comments and, you know, barely had been on Facebook before. So many people have just stepped up to the plate. And so thank you for that. Uh, Beyond that, I just want to say as we start that if you're new with us, we want to know this is the end of the year, but maybe it's your first time with us. And so here's what you got to do, because we, I can't connect with you if you don't say hi. And so I would love for you to go to creekside.me. There's a button that says new. Click it, fill out the form, and I will send you an email and say, hey, happy new year. Thanks for being online with us. Uh, we hope that we can meet eventually. So please, please, please do that. Um, in fact, you can go to creekside.me and donate, sign up, you know, do just about anything as far as next steps in our church. So go to creekside.me if you want to connect and, and you want to take further steps at, in our church, being a part of our church, maybe serving like these people in front of me do, uh, go to creekside.me. Right, so here's, here's the question for today. We're going to have you comment. We do this sometimes, but uh, here's my question. We We'll talk about it here amongst ourselves. But for you online below, here's what I want you to do. I want to answer this question. How do you feel about Christmas being over, but I want you to do it with one single emoji? And so below in the comments right now, one emoji to let me know, let us know how you feel about Christmas being over. Again, thanks for being here, everybody. Good morning. Hello, and happy after Christmas Sunday. <laughs> I'm sure that most of you are very relieved with all the craziness going on with Christmas and then craziness with just the time we're in. It's just nice to have a time where we have just a slight bit of amount of time off work and 
time with close family. And I just want to in invite us all to, to come in to this place and just worship God for the time we've had with our family and for the safety that he's kept us in. Let's all stand together and worship him.
Through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living
lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh Lord, we just come to you knowing that you are our living hope. You've broken every chain on us. You've set us free, Lord. We just praise you for that. Lord, I ask that you come into each and every single one of our hearts and just demolish all evil. Any impure thoughts, Lord, let it, let it be destroyed by you and replaced by knowledge of your good and glory, Lord. We just ask that you give us wisdom and understanding to take away what you want us to take away from this sermon, Lord. All this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Morning again, everybody. Uh, I just want to jump right in and say, last Sunday I preached about the gift, and what I said was that that Jesus, this baby that we celebrate this time of year, a couple of days ago now, uh, we we celebrated Christmas. The baby that we celebrate this time of year was, in fact, the gift. Jesus, in Paul's writings in Romans, was the gift, but the gift was not just Jesus. It was Jesus and all that Jesus brought for us, all that Jesus offers us. And in the passage of scripture that we're going to look at together this morning, Paul is really going to continue down the same line. In fact, last week we looked at Romans 5, 12 through 15, and and the remaining verses of the chapter are connected. I chose to split the paragraph for preaching, but the paragraph is really one kind of seamless thought that Paul presents to us. And what we're going to see today is that, is that while Jesus is the gift and it's all that he brings, you know, we're actually going to look and we're going to see some of the benefits that Jesus brought when he decided to come to earth, live sinlessly, and die for our sins. And so that's, that's what's in, in mind here as Paul turns his attention back to the gift in Romans 5, 16 and 17. Listen to this. Nor can the gift, Jesus, of God be compared with the results of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So Paul is in the middle here of comparing and, and even more contrasting, we'll see the comparison in a second, but, but comparing and contrasting Adam, who was the first man ever created, and who Paul in 5, 12 through 15 said uh, it was the one through whom sin and death entered in the world. He is comparing and contrasting Adam and Jesus. And, and here he stops to just remind us of something that I think is just so intuitive, and that is that Jesus' gift the gift that comes in Jesus through Jesus is far better than, than what came through the sin of Adam. And the most obvious reason for this is that Jesus' act brings good while Adam's act, the uh, rejection of God's will, sin against God, it brought all kinds of bad things. And I want you just to hold that thought in your mind because, because really we're going to see that through and through here. Paul is is showing us more clearly than last week's three verses. He's showing us more clearly the the difference between Adam and Christ, and he's really showing us all of the bad in Adam and all of the good that can be found in 
Christ. And this is exactly what he's doing. I mean, you can see just here in these, these, this simple word, he says that through Adam, condemnation came. And, and that's an interesting word because condemnation is exactly opposite of what justification means. If you've been around for this series, then, then hopefully you know by now that justification is to be declared innocent. And condemnation is exactly the opposite of that. It is, it is to have a sentence pronounced against you. It is to be declared guilty. And if you look at scripture as a whole, you would see that the condemnation that we're talking about here is a condemnation that lasts for eternity. We are declared guilty and that guilt will carry on into an eternity are separated from our God if we are in Adam and not in Christ. Now, I've been kind of hitting on this and alluding to it, but I, but I want to get deeper into it. Uh, there's in Adam and there's in Christ. And really what Paul is doing is he is, is showing us that we can be in one of two spheres. And, and there was this word that I, I just kind of skipped over last week. But, but the idea beyond the word is that we have, been, we have been like introduced into the sphere of Jesus if we've become Christians. We've been invited into it. We've been introduced. We've been brought into that sphere. And, and the way that I pictured that when I, when I read that word was like a door. And so I, wanna, I just want to show you, uh, I, this is how I, I'm going to illustrate this today. I don't know if it's any good. Uh, if I had more time or resources, I would have brought two doors. If we were like a mega church, we could have had two doors up here. But, but instead, I have Dollar Tree paper. Um, and so uh, the idea that's seemingly presented here in the book of Romans that Paul is getting at is that Adam was door number one. Adam was door number one. And I'm going to show you some words on the back of this later, but, but he opened the door for us to be in, you know, sin and death and all of the condemnation that, uh, that comes through uh, our own personal sin. And so, so that's door number one. I feel like I'm that old game show. And, and all people are born, and as soon as we're born, we are invited to, we're invited in to this door. In fact, we just go in, and we willingly go in, and we don't even think about it. And so Adam opens up door number one for every person in existence, and we all then, we move into the reign of sin and death inside that door. But, but now, Paul is saying, there's another door, and that door is Jesus. The door is Jesus, and this door opens up uh, a new sphere to us, a, a new way of being that, that comes with all sorts of good things that Paul begins to get into in the verses that we have already read. You see the word justification there, you see grace, you see righteousness, and you see life. And so Paul begins to say, okay, look, all of us, all of us were born, we enter door number one. But there is a way that you can go through a second door, and in that second door, you find so many great things that trump, that supersede, that do away with all of the stuff that is in door number one. And, and what Paul says here in, in the verses we've already read is that we are allowed to enter into this door because of God's abundant provision of grace. This is another contrast with Adam and I think that it's important to recognize that, that we go into this door because of our own decisions, because of the things that we've chosen to do. We're born, this door is open to us, and all of us just so easily go in and make our own sin. But this door, we only can enter this door through grace, not by our own actions. And that's what Paul's getting at when he says that this door is open to us, this sphere is open by the abundant provision of God's grace. You're going to see us in this, this passage as we move along in it uh, that grace is a really big deal. And, and I just wanted to find it one more time. I, I gave the same illustration the last two weeks. I'm not going to do it again. But I'll just say grace is simply receiving a gift when we deserved a punishment. And so Paul now has set this up. He says, look, there's, there's these two kind of spheres. This is what the language is getting at. There's these two doors that you can go in and, and exist in and live in and be in. And, and the one you, you choose to be in by the nature of your sin, the other only comes through grace. But in this door, that is where you find the gift. That is where you find Jesus and all that Jesus has offered us on the cross. Now, again, I, I want to just come back to why I'm, I'm saying that the gift is Jesus. And, and the reason for that is, if you look at how Paul uses the term the gift, 
It's actually a really interesting study if you want to go down a biblical study rabbit hole. But in verse 17, which I just read, he, he talks about the gift of righteousness. And so you go, well, it's just clearly righteousness. But uh, later in Romans 6, 23, he says the same word, the gift, and he says that it's eternal life. And in fact, in our verses this morning, he actually sets up the gift uh, and, and he sets it up against the trespass of Adam. And so it seems to be, we seem uh, to see this connection really that, that ultimately the gift is in fact Jesus, the baby whose birth we are celebrating this time of year. It's Jesus and because I don't think we can stop there. It's not like just his birth was the gift. It's Jesus and all that Jesus offers us. Grace, eternal life, so many things that we see in this passage that I'll come back to in a second. And so Paul is like, hey, uh, you know, the gift is not like the one who sinned. There's the language. The gift is not like the one who sinned because this gift is so much better. The, the, the action of Adam brought death and sin, but the action of Jesus brings all of these incredible things that we who are Christians just get to live in. We get to be in the sphere of these incredible things. Uh, I mentioned last week, I'm going to say it again, just so you know, I'm not just intentionally, you know, skipping over it because I don't want to deal with it. But sin is a big deal in, in Romans 5, 6, 7, and uh, in those three chapters specifically. And in chapter 7, I mean, it's like a deep dive into sin. And I, I want to I hash out what sin is because I don't think that's a word that people understand anymore. But we'll do that in the coming weeks. Not today, not during the holidays. But the big idea here is that you exist you exist right now. Every person I'm talking to online, you either exist in the sphere of Adam where there is sin and death and condemnation or you exist in the sphere of Jesus because of the abundant grace of God that, that really was poured out for you on the cross. And so here's then what Paul says in verses 18 and 19. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, many will be made righteous. What's so interesting about this paragraph is in verse 12, Paul says, hey, look, there's a comparison to be made between Adam and Jesus. And then Paul spends the next however many verses saying, let me tell you why they're not the same. It's a really weird way to, to write but finally in verse 18, he comes back to the comparison. He stops contrasting the two and he comes back to the comparison between Adam and Jesus. And, and it's quite a clear comparison, right? Just as Adam's sin brought sin into the world and death for all people, so the death of Jesus, the grace of God through the death of Jesus, so the gift that is Jesus, we can have universally, any person can have, we'll see who gets it in a second, but any person can have all of the good that comes with Jesus. Really, Paul is, is setting up the comparison between, between Adam and Jesus because while Adam brought condemnation for all, Jesus offers salvation for all. It says that there's these acts. We read about the act of Adam last week. It was disobedience to God. He wasn't supposed to eat the fruit. He ate the fruit. But what is the, the righteous act or the act of obedience for Jesus? Well, we read about that in Philippians 2, 6 through 11. This is about Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The obedient act of Jesus was his willingness to come from the glories of heaven to earth to become a man, a servant, 
Uh, and not only that, he, he, while living, he chose to willingly go to the cross. He died the worst of sinners' deaths. That was the act of obedience. And so Paul says, Adam committed an act of disobedience, not doing what God wanted, and that brought all of this bad stuff. It, it brought you into a sphere that is filled with death and condemnation. But Jesus' act of obedience, the death on the cross that he died, it makes it so that you can have eternal life. That's what Paul is saying here. And so let me just again bring these back and make it really clear. Adam ate fruit. It meant that you could enter into this door, that you would enter into this door. Jesus died on a cross. That's why I made this red. Jesus poured out his blood on a cross and it allowed for you to enter into a new sphere of existence. Uh, the story we believe as Christians is called the gospel and I just want to make it really clear to you, each and every one of us is sinners, each and every one of us, you know, not just because Adam did it, but because we do it too, we live here. But Jesus came from heaven to earth, he died on a cross, even though he was totally and perfectly sinless. And because of that, his death and then subsequent resurrection, because of that, God looks at us and says, if you will place your faith in my son Jesus who died for your sins, then you can move here. You can become a Christian who has all of this stuff erased, but not only that, gains so much more justification and uh, uh, reconciliation with God and eternal life and you know all that is encompassed in the gift that is Jesus. That's the story we believe. I hope that that's the story that you believe because it's so important when we consider the incredible contrast uh, between Adam, his sphere, and Jesus and his sphere. And Paul is looking at us and saying, look, you, you exist in one or the other. You exist in one or the other. There is no question about that. But the comparison again between Adam and Jesus is that while this made it so, while Adam's act made it universally so, all people were sinners and, and destined for death and condemned, Jesus universally offered salvation to all people. And we'll see in the final verses who gets it, because not every person gets it. There is a big difference between Adam and Jesus there. In Romans 5, 20 and 21, it says, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ our Lord. And so let me just pause here and, and say that Paul immediately comes back to uh, the idea of the law. And I think it's it's really important to think about the law here because I think what Jewish readers of Paul's letter would have thought in the first century, they would, they would have said like, oh, wait a minute, like you're just summarizing this down to two spheres after all of salvation history. It's like that simple, like you're in one or the other. What about like our place in history? What about all the prophets and the things that they've said? Like, Paul, it can't be this simple. And so Paul then says this thing that would have been offensive to all those Jewish people. He says the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Now, pause here and say, not only that would this have been offensive to the first century Jew, I think any religious Jew today would, have, would, have, would be offended by this idea too. They should be offended by this the idea based on what they believe. Because Paul, Paul, I mean, pretty clearly and in a very negative way, he says, look, the law was brought in so that the trespass, sin, might actually increase. Now, what does that even mean, right? Like, it's one of those things, you, if you're just reading, you can either skip over it or you can ask the question, what does it really mean? And, and I, think, I think what Paul means to do here is to help us break through a belief that so many of us might have about the law or about law in, in general. And that is, uh, for people, we often think that law or rules it really neutralizes sin within us. Like if there's enough rules or enough laws, then we, then we, you know, we will sin less. But, but in Romans 7, Paul's going to come back to this. I said this last week, and I want to read you Romans 7, 8 here. He says, he says this, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. And so not only uh, does it not, does law not stop us from sinning? We do it anyway. The law actually helps us to know what sin is and it makes it worse when we break the law. The message of Romans says the law could count sin, but it could not 
counter it. The law makes our sin known to us, but it also makes it more blatant when we disregard the law. And so we see in Paul's you know, theology that the law exists in large part in order for us to recognize how deeply ingrained we are, it's the wrong side, in this sphere. It, it, the law exists so we can see just how much we are sinners. But Paul gives us the good news here, and I love this. I love this. Paul gives us the good news. He says that where sin increased through the law, grace also increased, or it increased all the more. Uh, Let me just stop because I said we'll talk about who gets to get the gift, right? Who gets to get the gift. And I think for some people what they believe is that the gift is given to those who who haven't sinned too much, who, who on, the, on the balance of life, they've done more good than they have done bad. And, and so for a lot of people, you know, that's a thought of hope. For other people, that's a thought of fear, right? Like, well, I just haven't done enough good. I'm, I'm out. But Paul, you know, begins to show us that that's not true. He says it's all by grace. It comes through Grace, and it comes through grace as as we place our faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is all about grace. You cannot earn your way into heaven, nor can you sin enough, and that's more at the heart of this section. You cannot sin so much that you, you can be outside of the ability for God's grace to save you. I actually just love what, what Paul says here, um, Paul actually uses this word that that I may mess this up. My Greek is okay usually, but this is kind of a hard word. It's like hooper parisio, hooper parisio, something like that. And and the word, and like this almost seems like something that my kids would say, but it actually means like grace superabounded. I feel like that's how a three-year-old would describe, you know, something that's really exciting. Like, oh, that's super awesome. And Paul says where sin is increased, God's grace super increases or super abounds. Uh, Bishop Lightfoot says, St. Paul is not satisfied with Parisian, which is another word he could have used, but he doubles the superlative. Uh, Superlative, I'm sorry, superlative. He doubles the superlative. He wants us to know that God's grace is super abounding for those, for all of us who need his grace to super abound unto us. Uh, my son was talking, I don't even know how this conversation came up. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old, for those of you who don't know, so I have conversations like this consistently. But somehow we were talking about superheroes and meeting superheroes. And, and my son, you know, thinking of superheroes like the Hulk, I think that's maybe his favorite right now, Spider-Man, Batman, he said a very wise and smart thing. He's a very smart three-year-old. He said, you can't meet a superhero. Like, what are you guys talking about as we're having this family conversation? You can't meet a superhero. And he's right when it comes to Spider-Man and Batman and the Hulk. But, but what we're seeing in this passage of Scripture is that Jesus really in some ways is a superhero because he brings the superabounding grace of God. And, and here's what we take hope in someday when our lives are over or when Jesus returns, we will meet a superhero. His name will be Jesus and he's a superhero because his power is the power of graciously offering his life for us so that no matter how deep we have gone into our sin, we can be brought out and here's all we have to do. Here it is, here it is. All we have to do is place our faith in what he has done on the cross and then his grace will be poured out and we will move into a new realm of existence, a new realm where we receive the gift. I want to flip this around now. Where we receive the gift, where we have justification, we're declared innocent, where we become righteous, where we have eternal life and where we, where we can just exist in a sphere that is called grace. Here's the reality. The gift, this gift, the gift that is Jesus, it is free to us but it cost God everything. Jesus' grace abounded unto us because he poured out his blood. And as Paul makes this comparison here, 
He says, here's the deal. You're, in, you're here or you're here. You're here or you're here. It's that simple. You're in one or the other. You're in, you're in a, a state of sin, death, and condemnation, or you're in a state of justification, righteousness, eternal life, and grace. These, these are really your choices. There's, uh, there's nothing else. You're in one or the other. And he says, there's a comparison to be made. Because this is universally true for all people apart from Christ. But this is universally available to all who place their faith in Christ. That's who receives this gift. That's who enters into this sphere is people who place their faith in Jesus. This we're destined for. This we have to make a decision for. And the decision is whether or not we are going to embrace Jesus the Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And that's exactly what Paul says at the end. He brings eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If Jesus is not your Lord, if Jesus is not the one that you follow and serve, if Jesus is not the one who you've given your life to, you are here. But when you make the decision to recognize him as Savior and Lord, you move here. And as Paul will say in Romans 8, nothing can pull you away from this. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ once you've moved into this sphere. But if you haven't made that choice, you exist here separated from separated from God and so uh, this morning is is you know we finish you know church for the year as we look at the end of Romans chapter 5 I, I just I want you to ask the question are you here are you in the reign of sin death and condemnation or are you here if you're here man you need to make a decision to move You need to make a decision to embrace the salvation of Jesus by what he did on the cross. You need to place your faith in him as your Lord and Savior. You need to ask him to forgive you for your sins and realize that he has because of his super abounding grace on the cross. Only if you place your faith in him. So if you're here, get here. If you want to talk about how to do that, you just let me know. You leave a comment below. You go to creekside.me. I would love to have that conversation with you. But it's as simple as bowing your head and saying, Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner and I believe I need your grace and I believe you died on the cross for me and so I'm going to declare you, I'm making you my Lord and Savior this morning and Jesus will come into your life. But for those of us who are here, I think we need to be just, just remember what we have, where we stand. Because sometimes I think we act like we're kind of like middle. I don't know what's in between red and black. My wife would know. She's a graphic designer. But, but like we're, we think of ourselves as kind of like in this middle. Like God's going to be, you know, mad at me all the time. And maybe I need to pay for some of my own sins by feeling guilty long enough. And uh, I mean, I... I some of you even question, I know, I know people like, am I still here even though I did that wrong thing? Or even though I have some doubts every now and then, am I still here? And the, the reality Paul is getting as you're here or you're here. And if you're here, it's a really good place to be. And you don't need to worry about this anymore. You just need to keep pressing forward into your justification, righteousness, and grace. And I read eternal life last because this is what I think we sometimes forget. I think when we talk about eternal life in Christian circles, we think of life that will begin someday. But what the Bible says to us is that when we move here to the red, let's just get rid of this for now, we're done with it. When we move here, when we move here, our eternal life begins. And it will last for eternity and it isn't perfect like it will be someday, but it starts now and we can have joy and hope and peace and we can move away from sin and and we can experience grace on a daily basis. It begins now and some of us need to start living as though we remember exactly where we stand or better yet who we stand in our Jesus our Savior who offers us an ever abounding grace a super grace that covers up all of our sins I think for some of us to come back to the gift idea since we called the series the gift I think some of us we've received the gift of Jesus we've moved into our new standing But sometimes we fail to unpack it and remember the benefits of it. And if I could offer those of you that are here today one thing to remember is that Jesus, like I said last week, is the gift that keeps on giving and we need to do our best to remember and and take hope in and celebrate and 
worship because of all that he has given us by choosing to come to earth and dying for our sins. Let me pray that those things will be true for, for you who are here and you who are there. Lord Jesus, I, I ask for those watching online right now that aren't Christians. And God, they, they stand in sin and death and condemnation. Their lives are defined by these things, Lord. And I pray, God, that you right now would call them into an eternal relationship with you and they would walk through the new door and into a new sphere where they can be righteous and and because of the righteousness declared innocent, God, and and where they can receive your incredibly super grace, God, and where they they can begin their eternal lives, Lord, and look forward to an even better life when this one is over on earth, Lord. I pray that you would move them there today. And God, for those who are already in your sphere, I pray, Lord, that they would be so pumped about it that they wouldn't hold sin over themselves. And and once they've repented, God, they would just feel your incredible grace and live in grace. And I pray they'd wanna share that grace with other people. And I pray they would celebrate that grace and and they would worship you because of that grace. And God, that that we would not only have received your gift, the gift that is you, Jesus, but God, we would also do our best to unpack it and take full advantage of it, God, every single day. I pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Hey, uh, if God's impacted you through this, if maybe he's whispering in your ear and he's calling you to become a Christian this morning, or maybe you're just, you've been, you know, a Christian for a long time, but you just constantly live in guilt and you're not overcoming sin in your life and you know that that needs to change. I don't know what it is, but if God's impacted you, through my words, this service today, please let me know by going to creekside.me, clicking on the respond button. I would love to be able to help you. I'd love to be able to pray for you. I'd love to be able to walk through some of these things with you. Thanks. Wow. What a challenging sermon. I think that it's very well timed and and very well given to us that we need to know who we are. If we are in Christ, we need to worship him as if we're in Christ. I know it's crazy. (laughs) We need to shout out from the mountaintops that we are no longer in sin and not boastfully but to declare the power and glory of God. Let's sing together. And 
And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child Stay praying that prayer, asking God into your heart. Know that you are no longer a slave, no longer a slave to the sin, to the fear, to the constant guilt. You are a child of God, and He loves you. Let's just take this time and pray with your families and your close friends. Let's just glorify the Lord for what He saved us from. We are no longer slaves. say it together. I am a child of God. Let's sing this out. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. You drowned my fears in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. 
Yes, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy s h 
worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Oh Lord, I just ask that you be with us as we go out from this place. As we go about our days, Lord, I just ask that you continue to grow in us and help us just transfer our lives over to you, Lord. I pray for all the new believers here. And I pray for all the old ones as well, that we continue to have a soul on fire for your glory and for your power, Lord. Everything we are, Lord, let us just glorify you. All this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you for being here with us. And have yourself a great week. Thank you.